even though as a Japanese person in Hawaii, my socioeconomic status and privilege is, is much better than it was for uh, my grandparents' generation. They're not facing racism in the same way as it was uh, during uh, World War II when you know, Japanese were considered enemy aliens, right? But uh, that means, so what do, I, what do I do with this access and privilege? How do I continue to build and, and support those who are still struggling, right? For other, other kinds of oppression uh, so that we have a united front that can um, actually change the whole system. Hi guys, welcome back to The Situation Room, a journey into Asian America. We dive deep into the issues in the Asian American community from questions like, where are you really from? And representation to sharing food and our own experiences. My name is Emily Villaverde. And I'm Zach King. Today we have an incredible episode for you all. And you know, to most of us, the mainland, the mainland Hawaii, you know, seems like a tropical paradise tourist escape. But you know, in the Situation Room, you know, this is an Asian American show, an Asian American Pacific Islander show. And you know, when we talk about AAPI issues a lot, we, you know, as a podcast, but also as a nation, we don't pay enough attention to Pacific Islander and Native Hawaiian groups, um, you know, that are under this umbrella term. Uh, so in this episode, we interviewed Dr. Kyle Kajihiro uh, to learn why our perception of Hawaii as a perfect paradise covers up many of the social and environmental issues uh, that Native Hawaiians face. He is a lecturer of ethnic studies and geography at the University of Hawaii at Manoa and a founder of the Hawaii Detours Project, which we found super interesting and we talk about a lot with him. Yes, Dr. Kajihiro is going to go more in depth in this episode and uh, explain to us about the story of the Hawaii Detours Project, um, but aims to also tell the story of Hawaii to highlight the Native Hawaiian and social justice issues from a decolonized perspective. We learned so much from just talking with him and getting to know his story and his experiences um, about Hawaii's past and where it is today and where it's going from here on out. So I love this episode. I'm really excited for you guys to tune in. This is one of our, our best interviews, I think. Like the yeah, definitely. Content wise. Yeah, I'm, I'm so excited. But yeah, Emily, it's been a while. How have you been? Oh my goodness, it's been crazy. Okay, so a little bit of an update. Fall semester has ended. So I am back home in New Jersey um, recording from my bedroom and, you know, it was a crazy semester, remote learning, um, the hybrid models that a lot of schools were implementing um, because of the COVID-19 pandemic. You know, I think we ended pretty strong and it was it was an experience, but, you know, you can't really complain too much. Yeah, I'm glad you're doing all right. Um, we have been on and off again because there's been a lot of stuff this semester, you know. Yeah. Uh, but we are excited for the break coming up and we're going to work hard to bring all of y'all a lot of good content. Uh, so stay tuned, stick with us. This is going to be, I think, our last interview for season, for season one. Yeah, our like, last topic interview for season one. Uh, and then we're going to try to get a finale uh, and then grind on season two. So yes. stay, stay tuned. We're getting better every day. Um, this has been an incredible experience. Um, oh, absolutely. Super, yeah. I mean, like recently was Thanksgiving as of recording this. Um, super thankful to, <laughs> to have Emily and our team at Crimson Planet Media and Keystone Digital TV um, yes. and for our audience, of course. Yeah. I am so thankful for all of you tuning in from home, school, wherever you are. Um, you guys listening to our content is the reason why Zach and I are doing this every week. So from the bottom of my heart, thank you guys. Yes, let's get into that interview. All right, guys, welcome back. We are in the Situation Room, and this week we have Dr. Kyle Kajihiro with us. Welcome, Kyle. We are so excited to have you on our show. Why don't you start by telling us and everyone tuning in about yourself? Aloha. Well, thanks, Zach and Emily, for inviting me. It's great to be with you. Um, so just a little bit about me. Uh, I was born and raised in Hawaii. I'm fourth generation Japanese, so we would say Yonsei. 
uh, my, my family comes from um, southern Japan and came to work in the sugarcane plantations in the late 19th century. Uh, I grew up in uh, Mo'ili'ili, which is a neighborhood near the University of Hawaii, kind of centrally located. Um, and um, uh, I guess for myself, I got, uh, I got sort of more active in, um, when I went to, away to college in Oregon. Uh, and that's where I, I really start, started to have a better sense of um, racial issues in the United States. Uh, I worked for a time uh, with the American Friends Service Committee from 1996 to about 2011. They're a peace and social justice organization. And now uh, we've transitioned our program, our local program, into a group called Hawaii Peace and Justice. Um, and then I, I also just recently finished the, my doctorate in geography at the University of Hawaii. So I do some teaching in geography and also ethnic studies at UH. Congratulations. Yeah, thank you. <laughs> of course, we're super excited. And so uh, we want to talk about your detours, uh, which we'll get into a little more later, uh, because okay. I think you share really valuable experience um, and perspective. But before, I think it's a little important to understand uh, some of the context and, and history of Hawaii uh, and how it became a state. And I know it's it's tough to do the whole story justice by talking about it briefly, but would you be able to briefly share with us how Hawaii became a state? Okay, sure. So just cut me off if I'm going too long. <laughs> You're good. <laughs> but uh, but um, yeah, that's the really important story. So maybe um, some folks might not realize that Hawaii was an independent nation state uh, until uh, 1898. Uh, and actually many people would argue that uh, it still um, maintains a claim to its to sovereignty and that the United States uh, has illegally occupied Hawaii since 1898. Um, but the, basically the, um, uh, the Haole or white sugar planters and business interests in Hawaii uh, wanted to um, seize power uh, to further their economic interests by having a closer alignment with the United States. So they conspired with the US minister to uh, overthrow the lawful government of the Hawaiian kingdom. And um, so there was a kind of a, a collusion between the settlers and the U.S. military. And the United States wanted uh, really the, the geopolitical uh, location of Hawaii in order to expand its power across the Pacific. Uh, at that time, China was the prize, right? And they needed stepping stones for their um, military bases. And so um, basically, you could think of Hawaii and the, the overthrow as the first United States regime change where a sovereign government was overthrown, uh, a kind of a puppet uh, or client state was installed, and that enabled the United States to expand its control over the Pacific. So you could say Hawaii was a kind of a pivot or a fulcrum of American empire building. Awesome. Um, that, yeah, I always find that really interesting because, you know, our whole country is you know, founded on, you know, taking sovereign land uh, from others. And you know, it's often overlooked, uh, how Hawaii became a state because um, I, I was never taught any of this in school and you know something you, you talk about in your detours uh, is you know part of that story and so we're curious like what for our audience who don't know are your detours um, of Hawaii and uh, how did it all start? Sure thanks um, so yeah um, this, uh, this was something that we started to do informally with uh, colleagues and comrades and friends who would visit, folks who were doing political work in their own communities and uh, we were having a meeting or something. And it always struck us as, as odd and a little frustrating that folks who had otherwise great politics would come to Hawaii and something in their brain would turn off and they, they think they were coming to a playground and uh, they were coming on vacation and they couldn't see the kinds of issues that were happening here and, and so we realized that um, something was happening with the way the media represents Hawaii as a kind of a, a tropical paradise, as a tourist playground uh, that naturalizes its, um, its presence in the American imaginary, right? So that people uh, are already have some ideas about Hawaii that kind of get in the way of them actually engaging in uh, meaningful ways with the social justice issues here. So we started to take folks around to just orient them. So we were all on the, on the same page. We'd go to sites, talk about the history of the overthrow. 
we, we talk about, uh, we, we visit sites where the um, military and other kinds of um, struggles over land had taken place. Uh, we, we, we visit places where communities are still maintaining a Native Hawaiian uh, cultural practice. Um, and, and so that we could now see that, okay, this, this is not, um, there, there are other contested stories about Hawaii that uh, people need to understand. And then we could have a conversation about how we work together. So it started out informally and then eventually people started asking for us to, to do this with them. Uh, university professors or visiting um, scholars would bring their classes. Sometimes conferences would happen and they would ask us to uh, offer a detour as part of their um, field trips. And so that's how it started growing. And then the name detour just sort of evolved out of um, what we were doing. We were calling it decolonial or demilitarization tours, educational tours. And uh, um, eventually it got shortened to detours and we thought that that was appropriate because we were sort of swerving off the, the normal tourist uh, path uh, to look at things more critically, a, a more critical geography of Hawaii. Yeah, that's interesting. And, you know, one of the questions that I really had uh, for this when we got to the conversation about detours is important stops that you take you, the people that you um, you meet. Because back in uh, the summer of 2018, I went um, on a vacation with my family to Hawaii. We did two tours. We did one um, in Oahu and we uh, toured different spots in Honolulu and we saw mm -hmm. uh, Pearl Harbor. And another tour that we did was the Road to Hana in Maui. And I loved both tours. And I thought that, you know, it was an incredible tour. It was a really, really great experience to learn more about Hawaiian culture, see all the stops, eat the food, meet the locals. But there was always like something that I felt that I was missing out on. Um, so I know that your tours are not the same as those typical uh, right. tourists, uh, touristy uh, trips that are offered to tourists. But um, I want to ask, what are some of the important stops? Yeah, thanks. Um, so uh, typically, I mean, every tour is, is uh, somewhat different. Um, sometimes uh, we, we, you know, we try to tailor the tour to what the interests are of the group that we're working with. But uh, typically it would include a stop at the Iolani Palace which was the seat of government of the Hawaiian kingdom. And we talk about the events that took place there with the overthrow and also uh, the palace as a symbol, a living symbol of sovereignty today. Uh, it's, it's the only public building or one of two public buildings in Hawaii where only the Hawaiian kingdom flag flies. There's no American flag over it, right? So it's, it still is a place where sovereignty is, is sort of practiced by uh, Hawaiian leaders. Um, and then we talk about why that, that whole episode happened. Uh, and then we'll, we'll drive through um, uh, Chinatown and Kalihi. And these are sort of working class immigrant neighborhoods where there had been struggles over land and displacement. Uh, we end up going to uh, 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 Camp Smith, which is the headquarters of the United States Indo-Pacific Command. And it sort of overlooks Pearl Harbor. So we, there we talk about how uh, Kealvalao o Pu'uloa, which is the Hawaiian name for Pearl Harbor, how that place was the prize that the United States wanted. And that was part of the whole um, series of events that led to the U.S. taking over. So we, we, we uh, stand there outside the gate and we sort of uh, talk about these different um, um, histories and geographies, sort of looking down from the vantage point of this hill, looking down over Pearl Harbor. We drive through the area. And then we stop at the Pearl Harbor Memorial and do sort of a, mm -hmm. a, a walk through and a kind of a critical narrative against the grain. Uh, one thing we want to highlight is the Hawaiian place names and the Hawaiian stories that are still there, right? But they've been sort of layered over with this other narrative that sort of erases it. Uh, we ask these questions about, you know, what does it mean that this place was once a, 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 a food basket for the people of Oahu? It was a place of, of abundance that is now toxic. It's now a place that's preparing for war. Uh, and mm -hmm. uh, the war memory sort of erases all of that other history. So we asked, what, what, what about, um, what if this place was instead of a war memorial, what if it was a peace memorial? How, how would we remember the events of history in this location differently? And what work would that do in terms of our foreign policy, in terms of domestic policy 
moving forward if we had a different orientation to the significance of that site. Um, and then we try to end at some place that's a little bit more uplifting. So sometimes we'll visit with some friends who have land that they're uh, restoring to Hawaiian cultural practice. And they use those places as uh, training areas for culture, cultural practice, but also political organizing uh, and creative like arts camps and things like that. So it's a place of resurgence, an indigenous resurgence that we like to end there and then discuss, okay, after all we've seen, what are some other visions and um, possible futures that we'd like to see, right? What, what, can, what kind of future can we imagine after seeing the, both the negative side of it, but also what's, what's possible in the midst of all of that? Oh, wow, that's fascinating. Just because, you know, I never really thought about uh, Pearl Harbor as what if it was a peace memorial, not a war memorial, because when, you know, we did a tour of Pearl Harbor, me and my family, and we walked through the memorial and we heard like the different events. We looked at all of the different artifacts and the entire time they were just talking about the bombings and the lives lost and what should be remembered. But that's a really interesting way to look at it. Instead of a time of war, think of it as, you know, think of it as something else. Right. right. I think, you know, war memorials tend to, uh, they tend to have a patriotic cast to it, right? So that, mm -hmm. that, that plays into nationalism in certain ways. It tends to um, uh, tell a story of innocence, right? It's an appeal to the innocence of U.S. geopolitics, which um, kind of hides the, the violence and um, harm that um, U.S. militarism might be doing to other parts of the world. Uh, and so one, one example of the erasure that happens, if you walk through the exhibit, if you recall, the, the casualties of the Pearl Harbor bombing uh, were pretty graphic. Uh, there were yeah. images of bodies and so forth. But at the end of the hallway there, um, there was one picture about the, the road to peace that showed the aftermath of the Hiroshima atomic bomb. I don't know if you mm -hmm. noticed that, but it was, it was a tiny picture and there were no people depicted in that picture. So contrast which lives are grievable, right? And which ones are not. And it was a controversy to even include Hiroshima Nagasaki in the exhibit because some people were protesting that you know, it made America look bad. Uh, but they included that picture and all they could agree upon was a picture that had no bodies and no casualties in it. It was just a bombed out tower, right? Um, so that, that tells you something about the politics that are embedded in that story and why mm -hmm. we need to continue to interrogate it. Wow, no, that's very interesting. Um, and I'm, I, I know we're not, uh, we're not trying to minimize what happened in Pearl Harbor, but exactly. you know, but criticizing um, you know how we view uh, Pulo and the area, I think is very important. And the you know points you bring out are really interesting because I think you're claiming that um, the memorialization of Pearl Harbor and the, the you know patriotic uh, vibe that it brings is overcasting the issues that are underlying. Um, and I think you kind of touch on that. I see a parallel between. Uh, the tourism aspect and viewing Hawaii as a as a paradise as also overcasting on you know some of these uh, social and, and environmental issues. Can you uh, tell us more about what these social and environmental issues are and how they kind of tie to militarization and tourism? Sure. Yeah. So um, the military is uh, um, they they have about 142 um, bases in Hawaii or military sites they call it. Um, it's a small place, but they have a lot of land um, and approximately 25% of the land on Oahu, the island where I live, uh, is under U.S. military control. Most of that land uh, belong to the Hawaiian kingdom. So it, they're, they're handled as sort of a trust land uh, for Native Hawaiians. And so there's a competing claim for that, for that land. So there's, there's contemporary impacts. And if you look at what has happened over the years environmentally, there are over a thousand contaminated sites on these military bases. Some of them are unexploded ordnance, depleted uranium, uh, toxic chemicals, fuel spills, and so forth. So there's just uh, many environmental uh, uh, harms, uh, cultural sites that are damaged, sacred sites of Native Hawaiians that were used as bombing ranges, burial sites where the, the bones are excavated to make way for construction projects. So these are all sort of everyday forms of, of violence against the environment and the culture that are not visible to most people, right? So we say that uh, the impacts of militarization are everywhere in Hawaii, but they're hidden in plain sight. 
And so that's partly why we did the detours was how do, how do we make some of this stuff more visible so that we can have a, a real conversation about it. And I think the thing about uh, um, the tourism aspect, so um, tourism and militarism sort of work hand in hand. Uh, one provides sort of the muscle to maintain a certain economic and political system in place. And the other one creates a certain narrative that disguises the violence that's inherent to that system. Right? So the Pacific scholar, Teresia Teowa, uh, uses the expression militarism to talk about how those two forces are kind of intertwined, right? Those two discourses and, and those two economic and political practices are intertwined in a way that one supports the other, one masks the, the operations of the other, uh, and they, they perpetuate and naturalize a certain kind of situation. Uh, not only in Hawaii, you know, Okinawa has the same thing, Guam, uh, and other parts of the Pacific. Uh, but uh, in Hawaii, it's, it, we, we try to point that out because it's one way we can sort of peel back the layers and then begin to have a conversation about, you know, the realities. Wow, no, that, that's very interesting. I've never heard the, the term militarism before. Um, because, mm -hmm. I mean, though, it's a very uh, interesting concept that uh, if you live in the mainland, like, that's completely foreign to you. Um, you know, because, like, our big tourist sites are, like, New York, and you don't think of it, you know, <laughs> anything yeah. like that. Right. Yeah. And, uh, you know, and you mentioned Pearl Harbor, uh, the memorial. That's the largest tourist attraction in the islands. That's you right. Think about the millions of people who visit that every year, um, and what story are they getting, right? What is that reinforcing in terms of their understanding of Hawaii, and the relationship of Hawaii to the United States, right? Or Hawaii to the rest of the world, mm -hmm. right? So I'm curious, like, what kind of shift do we need to take, whether that's like mindset or there are certain actionable, actionable policies uh, to sort of, you know, improve um, the relations between Native Hawaiians and those social and environmental issues? Well, um, I think that... Uh, you know, Hawaiians are trying to regain sovereignty and control over lands. Uh, mm -hmm. They're trying to get back land from the military and we've, and, and they've been successful in some places. So the island of Kaho'olawe, which is actually where this photograph in the, my background was taken from, that was used as a bombing range for about 50 years before Hawaiians uh, started to protest and they succeeded in stopping the bombing and getting the island returned. So I think that's one thing that people can support is these efforts to, um, reclaim lands that have been stolen, uh, get the military and the government to uh, clean up and, and restore them. Uh, that's something that we, we definitely need support. Uh, but I also think that it's important for um, uh, people in the United States to put pressure on the government to stop the kind of militaristic policies that um, depend on militarizing islands in the Pacific or other parts of the world, mm -hmm. right? And that perpetuate war. So it, it becomes a kind of a, a cycle that um, a feed, positive feedback loop where more bases produce more warfare, more warfare pr generates this sense of insecurity that we need to militarize even further, right? And that's causing problems uh, in Hawaii, in uh, the Marshall Islands, in Guam, uh, Palau, Okinawa, Jeju Island in Korea, um, you know, in the Philippines, uh, the bases were expelled after um, uh, the the Philippine Senate voted uh, to terminate the treaty. And now uh, the bases are back again because of the tensions with China. So if we can reset the geopolitical discussion where the, we aren't used, islands in the Pacific aren't used as weapons or tools of either China or the United States, right? That we, maybe we can have a, a more peaceful world and a better economic and um, prospects for our region if it was a zone of peace, right? a buffer zone between these uh, these large uh, superpowers as a you know and not not a place that um, is used as chess pieces gotcha. well another thing that I wanted to talk to you about uh, Kyle was something that's happened relatively recently in Hawaii um, so there were plans to build a mega telescope on um, Mauna Kea uh, yes. there as of right now there are 13 telescopes already set up at the base of this volcano, but as of right now, there are plans to construct a 30 meter telescope near the summit. And one question that I have for you is, how does this impact the indigenous people that are currently living um, in Mauna Kea? And what does this mean to the other, you know, native Hawaiians? Right, 
So that, um, that struggle to protect Mauna Kea from this industrial telescope development was uh, really uh, an amazing um, moment uh, in, in Hawaiian history. It was one of the largest mobilizations of Kanaka OEV or Native Hawaiians, um, even I think bigger than some of the earlier struggles in the 70s. And the mountain oh, wow. itself is considered a temple site, right? It's the highest point in the Pacific, uh, which brings people closest to the heavens. And so in the Hawaiian cosmology, Wakea is, is like the god, that, the deity of the sky, the expanse of the sky. Papa is the earth. And so this is a place where they meet. Um, this is also a dwelling place of other deities, right? Poliahu, the, she, she's the snow and the mist. Um, so so there's, there's so many um, important sites. And when you're there, you're, you're actually on the summit, you feel it physically um, that it's a special place, right? So this, um, I think this struggle is, is about the Mauna, but it's also about a larger conversation and a larger struggle over who gets to decide what happens with these most sacred places, right? Mm -hmm. The University of Hawaii right now controls it um, and they see it as something that will bring prestige and money and, and so forth. Uh, but it's really not their place to make that decision, right? Um, the international, um, Human Rights for Indigenous People, the treaty that defines international human rights for Indigenous peoples, says that um, they have the right of free, prior, and informed consent when there's some kind of a development that might affect their sovereignty, their cultural practice, and survival environment, and so forth. And so this is an example where Hawaiians are exercising their right to descent uh, to a project to say, no, you know, it's, it's enough. There's already 13 telescopes, as you mentioned. Yeah. Right. And so um, it's not that people are against science or astronomy, but it's just that it's caused tremendous harm already. What's already up there is like an industrial park in a conservation mm -hmm. area. Yeah. So um, it's forced us to have another conversation, I think, about what is responsible science. Right? How do we decolonize our very notions of what science is and, and how mm -hmm. does science act in an ethical way with both the environment, but also with uh, native peoples? And the peoples that are affected by their projects. Interesting. Yeah, because I was doing a little research on it um, before we sat down with this interview with you, and I was reading about the significance for the Native Hawaiians on um, yes. you know, what the, right the summit of Mauna Kea means. And it's interesting that you added that, you know, when you're actually on the summit, you feel it. You feel the difference because it's the highest point and it's that just reading about the um, connection that Native Hawaiians have with this one location. Um, that's one thing that I really wanted to ask about was just what does this mean? Like the idea of possibly taking away this, this you know, sacred place and using it for, you know, science and, you know, what kind of science needs um, determines, you know, whether we leave this place alone or do we utilize it to you know reach that new frontier right and you know to give you an idea of how um significant this place was for kanaka oev kanaka uh, native hawaiian people mm -hmm. uh, it, it's it was considered the realm of the of the gods um those mm -hmm. highest points right and so people rarely went there you only went there if you really had a purpose to go there Otherwise, you didn't go in there and, and leave footprints and, and leave a lot of traces of yourself because it wasn't your mm -hmm. place to do that, right? So it's about also recognizing that there are entities in, in the environment and nature that also have certain rights, right? And I think we've seen that in some parts of the world where rivers and mountains are, are afforded legal rights to exist free from human intervention, right? The, the, the mm -hmm. nature doesn't exist for us that we have to coexist together and we have mutual responsibilities. And I think that's a kind of wisdom that comes from indigenous relationships to place that have made, you know, that, that are much more sustainable than what we have right now, where the earth is treated as something that exists for humans to, to exploit, right? And that, mm -hmm. that also leads to people being exploited, right, for the, for the purpose of uh, making profits or what have you. So I, I think that, you know, these are all kind of crucial questions that crystallized in this movement for Mauna Kea and they're continuing. We're seeing the fruits of that continuing because people had to reset um, that encampment that happened at the base of Mauna Kea, the Pu'uhonua um, yeah. or Pu'uhuluhulu, was um, 
it was a little city, right? The people established a kind of uh, alternative governance that was really remarkable, right? This idea of kapo aloha, this, this law in a sense of how you conduct yourself with, with respect, with dignity, um, mutual uh, um, responsibilities. Uh, that sort of governed the conduct of everyone in that space. And that, that it was like a little microcosm of what a future that we might want to have instead, right? Based on how do you care for your elders? How do you teach? You know, there's free education, there's free food, free health care. Um, you know, if you had a need, they would, people would try to provide it. They would crowdsource it from the, everyone who was there. So it was, it was a kind of a, um, a social experiment in a way that showed us what's possible if we had different values governing our society. All right. Well, thank you, Kyle, for that answer. Guys, we're going to take a short break, but we'll be back for more questions with Dr. Kyle Kajihiro. All right, welcome back into the Situation Room. We are here with Dr. Kyle Kajihiro, and we are having a great interview so far, but uh, we're curious. Hawaii, to, to Emily and I, is very interesting because it is the, it's like no other state uh, demographically because uh, you have like the largest Asian American population. Uh, and so we're curious because in our country, this resurgence of the Black Lives Matter movement is changing you know, how we view and reflect on race. Uh, beyond you know, solely just African-Americans. Um, and so we're curious, like how, what is happening in Hawaii uh, as in regards to how we view race? Right, no, it's a amazing uh, moment in history right now with uh, Black Lives Matter, as you mentioned, but also um, the COVID-19 pandemic is sparking a resurgence in anti-Asian racism Right. So mm -hmm. we're seeing anti-Asian violence uh, spiking all over the place. Um, part of that's fueled by the rhetoric from uh, from the Trump administration. Um, we're seeing uh, here that there is some some racist uh, uh, incidents and backlash, uh, nothing like what's happening in other places. Um, and there have been a few um, demonstrations, uh, some quite large. Uh, we had a, a very large march organized by high school students which was amazing. Oh, wow. And they, they, they're new uh, activists, but they just felt moved and on social media and other folks jumped in to help. And it was like 10,000 people marched uh, for Black Lives on uh, one oh. weekend. So um, it is a moment here as well. But the, the issues, as you, as you mentioned, are um, somewhat different because we have no uh, single majority uh, ethnic or racial group. Um, and it's raising some, uh, I think, really important conversations about uh, anti-blackness within our local Asian communities, Native Hawaiian communities. People are having to contend with that because um, in many ways, because we don't have a large um, uh, black population in Hawaii, uh, that hadn't been a conversation that we were forced to reckon with. And, and Hawaii had never had slavery either, right? So. Um, the, the, the history of in relation to uh, blackness was was quite different, uh, but that doesn't mean that there wasn't anti-black racism in people's attitudes and prejudices and so forth. And so we're seeing some of those things emerge where folks are saying, well, what about, you know, all lives matter? What about, uh, you know, uh, our, you know, and, and fill in the blank of whatever group that, that might be. And so we're having to have these conversations about, well, saying black lives matter doesn't negate anybody else's life, right? It's about expanding that circle of concern and care uh, of, and responsibilities to include everyone. <clears throat> um, and it also is raising interesting questions about anti-Hawaiian uh, attitudes. Uh, one thing in Hawaii as a settler colonial society is that anti-Hawaiian-ness or the, the kind of the pressure to eliminate Hawaiians and at the same time, uh, you know, domesticate and use and exploit Hawaiian culture when it's convenient, those, those tensions are, have always been here. So we're, we're seeing, you know, kind of backlash to some of the Hawaiian issues, especially because of, of things like the success of the Mauna Kea uh, Protectors Movement has sparked some anti-Hawaiian backlash, right? The gains that Hawaiians have made over the years has sparked backlash, not only from uh, white people, but also from local Asians who feel that maybe some of our um, pro quote unquote progress or privilege in the islands is being threatened by Hawaiian 
claims, right? Um, and, I, and I think that, that those are unfounded, but it also raises question about what is the, what are our responsibilities as Asians who settled in Hawaii, like, like myself and my family, um, you know, how do we um, situate ourselves so that we're not colluding with the power structure to exploit and dispossess Native Hawaiians or to stand in the way, right, to stand as gatekeepers against more recent immigrants who are struggling to, you know, just to survive. And I'm thinking of uh, Filipinos, Southeast Asians, uh, the um, uh, large, we have a large Micronesian population that, that are coming here because they don't have resources for things like healthcare in their islands. Uh, and they're facing some really horrible racism from some of our own people, right? So those are the difficult conversations that we're having and we need to have more of. Uh, and create uh, kinds of institutions and um, maybe coalitions between our different communities so that we can do uh, a work to advance social justice for everyone, right? Yeah, it's interesting because, you know, um, I think with 2020 and this resurgence of the Black Lives Matters movement, it just brought so many things uh, to surface. And, you know, every different subgroup of Asian American Pacific Islanders face different challenges. But, you know, as people who don't live in Hawaii, like Zach, myself, and many of our listeners, we're curious, how are the privileges different between, you know, Asian Americans and Native Hawaiians? Because I know that you mentioned um, previously in Zach's question, um, privilege and, you know, having these mm -hmm. difficult conversations. So that's just, you know, something that we want to ask you about. Yeah, thank you. That's a, that's a complicated question and an important one. Because um, like with my ancestors, for example, and many of the other Asian groups that came here out of necessity, fleeing war and poverty, uh, or other kinds of situations or seeking opportunities, um, they often, you know, we often started out in uh, an oppressed uh, or low class status where mm -hmm. we had to struggle to just survive, right? Um, in many cases that, that struggle uh, re required organizing, collective action, right? So in the plantations, for example, Japanese uh, plantation workers, Filipino plantation workers had to forge unity among the, their communities in order to gain, make gains in, in um, their working conditions and wages. Or in the um, 40s, you know, the dock workers uh, had to organize and then also to then begin organizing politically so that we could take power in, in, in the state government. And so some of those gains, I think, were hard fought and won. Um, but at the same time, um, now that we've gained some foothold or some, made some advancements, uh, what are our responsibilities with those privileges? Right? And this is where we, um, the interests start to diverge, I think, from some of the other groups, where the Asian groups that have been here longer and have, have had more access to, to power and wealth, um, we start to become gatekeepers. We start to play a role as um, um, <clears throat> maintaining the power structure and, and sort of uh, beating down others who are organizing for, for more rights or more justice, right? And so this is uh, something that I think we, we need to have in our own community is like, what is the responsibility and the culpability of Asian settlers in the islands? And we, mm -hmm. you know, there's been a debate about even that terminology, but, you know, we've come and stayed. So we're not, like, I'm not, um, an immigrant myself, right? My, my great grandparents might have been immigrants when they first arrived here, but we stayed and made a life here. And um, so what is our kuleana? The word kuleana uh, is a Hawaiian word that means both privileges and responsibilities. And, and I think it's situational and contextual how you understand your kuleana, right? To a certain situation. So I think I'm still figuring that out. <laughs> it's going to be a lifelong process. And everyone should be having that conversation with themselves, not only here in Hawaii, but I think anywhere where we are, uh, our, our responsibilities to each other and to the place are, are, are contextual and shifting, right? So how do we, uh, how do, what's our responsibility to the legacy of slavery? Uh, what is our responsibility to the legacy of, of uh, dispossession of native peoples? Uh, or uh, in relation to U.S. imperialism and wars elsewhere, right? Those are all kinds of questions that I think um, um, we, we have a stake in and, and we should be thinking about. I really like the 
the answer you gave. I think you bring up a lot of thought provoking points. Um, and it's something that I've definitely thought about a lot because we as Asian Americans and, you know, AAPI communities, including like Pacific Islanders, you know, it's a very complex community. There are uh, every different group and even people within have, you know, face different, you know, systematic and, you know, social challenges. Um, and I think it's really fascinating because most people don't know that at all. Right. And so, you know, that's why we're doing this. We want to explore those. Um, and I really thank you for bringing that perspective into it and telling us, cause that is like the biggest community, uh, of, you know, both of all people of AAPI descent. Um, and I, I think it's really important because, you know, in, on the mainland, we, as Asian, like Asian Americans have, uh, many of us have a lot of privilege, but then a lot of us don't at the same time. And so it's really, you know, confusing. And then, you know, when you, uh, bring in other groups like, you know, uh, black Americans, like it's, you know, we definitely you know, have more privilege in that sense from a social standing, but then it's like, you know, it's a whole mess because we never faced the challenge of slavery. And so like, you know, talking about that and figuring those things out and not conflating you know, different struggles and, you know, playing a lot of people like to use the term oppression Olympics, I think is really important. And I really, you know, thank you for talking about that. Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. <clears throat> oh, go ahead, Emily. Oh, no. I was just going to say, it's, yeah, I, I also really wanted to thank you for that response because I, maybe it's just everything that's happened in this past year leading up to this interview now, but it's really important to ask those bigger questions. You know, what are our privileges and what are our responsibilities with whatever privileges that we have or don't have? Um, I think definitely I liked what you said that it's not just a question that one group has to ask themselves. So it doesn't have to be Native Hawaiians. It doesn't have to be Pacific Islanders or Asian Americans alone. And I think it's a question that all of us have to sit down, ask ourselves, and really just think about what we have right now, what's going on right now, and what we can do to you know, better ourselves, better our communities moving forward. So thank you for that answer. It was, I'm really glad that, you know, you said that because it just opened up um, something in my mind. Great. great. Thank you. Yeah. I, and it's great that you folks are doing this, uh, having these kind of conversations, you know, on, uh, on video and, and podcasts. So thank you. Um, let's see. I, I, I think I just want to add something to that too, is, is to remember that, you know, to give honor to our ancestors and the struggles that they faced. I think we need to not abandon those who are still struggling, right? Because mm -hmm. uh, we, we, we're not free or we haven't arrived at anywhere if, if other people are still locked out or other people are still being exploited or dispossessed. Um, and so that's where I think, uh, you know, and <clears throat> um, it's, it's knowing history and it's being responsible to that history, uh, even though our situation may, may have changed, right? So even though as a Japanese person in Hawaii, my socioeconomic status and privilege is, is much better than it was for uh, my grandparents' generation. They're not facing racism in the same way as it was uh, during uh, World War II when, you know, Japanese were considered enemy aliens, right? But... Uh, that means, so what do, I, what do I do with this access and privilege? How do I continue to build and, and support those who are still struggling, right? Other, other kinds of oppression uh, so that we have a united front that can um, actually change the whole system, right? It's not about me just getting access for, for me and my family or for my community. Mm -hmm. I like that. Yeah. So before we let you go, Kyle, um, here in the Situation Room, we ask everyone that we interview uh, a few questions. So I'm going to kick it off with, what do you think it means to be AAPI? AAPI, wow. <clears throat> so, you know, that's interesting because that label, <laughs> we, we, we don't live with that, those categories so much in Hawaii, right? Every ethnic group sort of has their own sort of label, or if we're all lumped together, it's like we're local or something, right? So um, I guess for me, um, like I was saying earlier, uh, I think it's, it's about being responsible to a legacy of struggle uh, about 
r recognizing that history and our responsibilities that come with that history. Um, it's, it's rejecting the, the seduction to be uh, to whiteness, right? I think Asian Americans uh, tend to be uh, positioned by the power structure in a way that's in proximity to whiteness, that we, we're enticed or allured into uh, uh, aspiring towards that uh, and, and those privileges that come with it. Uh, so I think it, it means being conscious about that uh, seduction and rejecting it. Uh, so we're not caught in this trap of the model minority, which is on its flip side is the is the um, yellow peril that um, is is now coming back with uh, you know China virus and all of this type of discourse, right? So um, you know may, maybe we we need to embrace a yellow peril in the more radical and revolutionary sense, where activists in the '70s were saying you know we stand with the black. Panthers and, and the black um, other liberation struggles, right? So if, if that's a peril to the existing system, then that's a good kind of threat to be because, you know, we're, we're, we're in common league for social justice with others that are struggling. That's awesome. And I, I see the parallel that you said that, you know, just because of our privilege now doesn't, you know, uh, mean that we're not obligated to, you know, help others, you know, who come after us. Um, and our next question, so, uh, is what is your favorite Asian dish? Because this, you know, our conversations sometimes on these episodes aren't as fun. Um, we talk about, you know, a lot of hard hitting topics. And so we want to, you know, make it a little light, uh, at the end. And so we're curious, what is your favorite Asian dish? Ooh, that's a, that's the hardest question because I have so many. <laughs> you don't have to pick a single one. And, and I love, I love food. Um, but I, I, so I would, I would say, um, the Japanese uh, New Year's dish, ozoni, which is a, a soup that's usually made with a broth and chicken mm -hmm. and mochi at the center of it. Uh, oh. and, and I just have fond memories of being with, um, you know, family on New Year's morning and having that soup and the chewy, mm -hmm. sticky, gooey um, mochi that, you know, holds us together, right? The stickiness that binds us as, oh. as family. I really like that. Yeah. Um, I just want to ask, because our listeners don't really get to hear a whole lot about Pacific Islander cuisine or Hawaiian cuisine, what would you consider your favorite food from Hawaii be? Ooh. Um, so <laughs> I, I, I think uh, lao lao, which is uh, a steamed dish of uh, um, the taro leaves are used as to mm -hmm. wrap, uh, usually pork, sometimes chicken. Uh, salted fish. Uh, sometimes there's a uh, sweet potato or other vegetables in there and they're bundled up and wrapped in another kind of leaf and then steamed. Uh, or in, in oh, traditional wow. cooking, it would, it would have been cooked in an emu underground and sort of a smoke steaming, uh, you know, using hot stones. Mm -hmm. uh, and it comes out really tender. The, the leaves become like sort of like spinach um, and it's just a bundle of goodness. Wow. So, wow. That sounds amazing. <laughs> Um, yeah, really good. Yeah. Okay. Next question: Who is your AAPI role model? Um. Gee, that's another tough one. There's so many, but I would say um, Grace Lee Boggs. She was a, a philosopher and an organizer and activist uh, for many years in Detroit. Um, and I, what I love is that she had a kind of a long vision that was hopeful and revolutionary. Right. She, she saw the potential of us to become better people and to change society in that way, uh, fundamentally. But at the same time, she was also grounded in community. She was working with youth. They were planting community gardens in the abandoned lots in their city after the economic collapse. And so she, she kept her feet on the ground at the same time she had this long vision. Uh, and she was an inspiration to many people who are doing um, community organizing. So wow. Grace, Grace Lee Boggs. That's awesome. I'll have to look more into her. Yeah. Our final question is, how can people connect with you or learn more about you? Um, so I, I teach uh, some classes at the University of Hawaii in ethnic studies and geography. So folks could maybe track me down there. Uh, also, um, I'm, I'm continuing to be involved with Hawaii Peace and Justice. Uh, so that's hawaiipeaceandjustice.org. And uh, our website is kind of kind of funky. It needs some updating. But um, you, can, you can send an email there and um, get in touch. 
And through that organization, we do the detours and other work. Very cool. Well, thank you again, or mahalo to Dr. Kyle Kajihiro for taking the time to join us in the Situ Asian Room. Guys, if you're interested in anything that we talked about in this interview today, um, things that we said, we will link resources, uh, ways to connect with Kyle in our show notes on our website, www.situasianroom.com. But yes, thank you so much, Kyle. Thank you. Thank you for having me. This was awesome. All right, guys, welcome back to Dish It Out. Uh, for this episode of the Situation Room, we actually have a special edition of Dish It Out, where Zach and I will be highlighting some of Hawaii's best dishes. And I am so, so excited for this. Um, I went on vacation to Hawaii with my family a couple years ago, and all we did was travel, see the sights, and eat a lot of good food. Um, Zach, before we started this, did you know of any local or traditional Hawaiian dishes? Uh, poke. Yeah, the big poke fan. Um, spam, I've, I've like seen spam masubi before, but only because you showed me. Okay. And have you that, had spam before? Just I have. Zone? Yeah. Okay. Um, my dad keeps buying it. And when I was gone at school, my dad kept buying it. And then my mom doesn't <laughs> like it. So she just like cooks it quickly. And then it keeps showing up in our pantry. So my, my dad is a fan. <laughs> uh, but no, it's, it's good. I don't eat often, but it's good. Yeah. All right. So for this to shit out, I'll kick it off. Uh, one thing that I definitely wanted to mention is coffee. Um, Hawaii is known for Kona coffee. And honestly, when I was in Hawaii, I think we had a cup of coffee at every meal. I'm not going to lie. I genuinely think I had a cup of coffee for breakfast, lunch, dinner, and dessert because it was so good. Um, but Kona coffee, in my opinion, it's a lot sweeter when brew. Um, and you know, you just, I drink coffee black. So just to taste like there are a lot of um sweeter notes in this um in the kona coffee bean as well as like the aromatics are a lot different and what i love about hawaii is that they take kona coffee they take coffee to a whole other level so they will uh dress it up you can have it just plain a cup of coffee um or you can have they have different lattes uh and one of my favorites was an affogato which is it it's an italian uh dessert but the hawaiians took it and did their own personal spin where uh this one place that i went to did kona espresso and they did macadamia nut ice cream so an affogato is essentially it's just a shot of espresso on top of a scoop of ice cream and it was incredible <laughs> The idea good. that you can just top ice cream with coffee is like my dream come true. <laughs> for those yeah. for those of you that don't really know me, I drink coffee religiously. I have it every single day. I am a coffee snob. <laughs> this is true. This is one of the first things I knew about you too. <laughs> we became friends. Yes. Um, and I remember because my roommate came back from Hawaii during winter break um this was like a year ago and he brought that, me back a bunch of Hawaiian coffee and I mentioned to you that I was like brewing in my <laughs> dorm and I had like cold brew and stuff and you were like can I try some <laughs> I think one of the first times we hung out with a bunch of our friends I think it was like 8 p.m and you were just like <laughs> you know, Zach like, yeah the first time Zach and I first hung out was we were hanging out with him and a couple of our other friends and he just pulls a giant mason jar um out of the fridge just full of cold brew coffee and he goes i just keep this with me yeah <laughs> and i was like this is brilliant i i love coffee too i'm not i don't drink it black like you i can't do that but um i'm a big fan of coffee you actually got me hawaiian coffee for my birthday in june i did yeah i always sweet. have hawaiian coffee i try and have hawaiian coffee with me like in my apartment um, my parents love it we have bags of kona coffee in our pantry um here in new jersey it's such a good, it's such a good coffee. <laughs> it's beautiful. Um, my dish uh, is not coffee or remotely. Wait, we mentioned spam. 
Oh yeah, yes. because I mentioned yeah. So it's spam masubi. I was like, wait a second. Um, yeah, so spam masubi. Uh, I've never had it before, but I might make it because it's pretty easy to make. You just cook up some spam. Uh, a lot of people use like soy sauce and like oyster sauce or teriyaki, or, like flavor it. Uh, you know, fry it in a skillet and then um, with some rice and then wrapped in nori. So it's like a finger food. Um, it is credited to Barbara Funamura. Yeah, Funamura, a Japanese American woman from Hawaii who is responsible uh, for inventing it. Uh, excuse me if I butchered anything. Um, but yeah, so really interesting because it's like a fusion of a lot of different cultures in Hawaii. Mm -hmm. um, but it's also important to like understand spam has a weird history, which I didn't understand at first. Uh, I was looking into it. So it was invented in food. yeah it was invented in 1937 in minnesota right um but it's kind of as we talked a lot about in this interview with Kai, uh, dr kachihiro like mm -hmm. uh, an extension of american militarization which is like crazy because during world war ii you know spam was a part of the american rations for the military and when they were deployed to asia and the pacific rim you know they brought it with them and with an overabundance of spam and all these food shortages in America tried to play a role of rebuilding these places devastated by the shortages and uh, during the war. Um, so supposedly, this spam became like a symbol of American generosity. Um, but it gets more complicated because for a lot of like Japanese Americans, their first time being introduced to spam was in the concentration camps, um, which makes everything more complicated. But Mm -hmm. I thought it was a really interesting history of spam as like when you know we the, the United States built all these military bases um, they also brought like commercial spam with them as well uh, which is why it's so popular uh, in many parts of Asia and the Pacific Islands yeah I personally um, the first time I tried spam masubi was when I was in Hawaii and I actually got it at just I think it was like a 7-Eleven and mm -hmm. I picked my family picked it up because we were on our way to um one of like our I guess tours or excursions and it can be you it can be eaten cold or hot and it's simple but it's it's filling and you know especially when you um fry the spam and you flavor it so that it's you know to whatever your liking is it's mm -hmm. so good but yeah okay Dude. before we actually um end dish it out zach brought a dish with some history behind it and i feel like coffee isn't enough so one dish that i want to talk about that is a staple comfort food in hawaii is the locomoco and i'm i know zach you've never heard of it um until i brought it up but this dish started at the lincoln grill in hilo hawaii and it all started because a bunch of teenagers came into that diner or that, yeah, that restaurant and they asked the, the cook to prepare something that was um, prepared easily and time efficiently. And it was cheap and it wasn't a sandwich because they were broke and they needed something quick, simple, and cheap. And they took some of the... Um, I guess like the uh, the ingredients that were in more that had like you know higher abundance, um, and they came up with the loco moco. So it's a contemporary dish, which means it can be altered. Um, it can have a, like different additions or customized to whoever's preparing it. But the traditional loco moco consists of a bed of white rice topped with a hamburger patty, a fried egg, and it's drowned in brown gravy. And oh. while it seems like a very, very heavy dish, it is. Um, <laughs> it's delicious. Oh. And you can see this you can see this on the menus of so many different um, diners, breakfast spots, restaurants. It's eaten for breakfast, lunch, dinner, at any point of the day. It's a comfort food, which is the beauty behind it is it can be eaten whenever you want. Wow. That's so mm -hmm. cool. Yeah, it's kind of like so when I thought of this, um, it's kind of like, when I first was introduced to the Locomoco, I thought of, um, you know, when you go to, like, you know how um, KFC has the, like, the little bowls with the chicken and the mashed potatoes, yeah. the corn and the gravy? That's what it reminded me of. 
but with a twist of like like an islander twist Mm -hmm. um and you can customize the meat so traditionally it's served with a hamburger patty but when i went on vacation to hawaii i saw different variations of it like there was bacon on top or spam uh people some restaurants added kalua pork which is a traditional way of preparing um pork in hawaii and even when if you can find it closer to the water um they serve seafood instead of meat and i seen um, a loco moco with mahi mahi instead of a hamburger patty, which was crazy. And I never try. I didn't try it myself, but seeing the just like the 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 roots and learning about this was really really fascinating. Wow, that's that's cool. I I feel like it kind of reminds me of Shepherd's Pie and like the fact that everything's mixed. And then it's just like a random a random. I don't know if it's that close, but it's yeah. just like things mixing together for me i don't know when i eat things it's like mostly separate and just like that. <laughs> um yeah no that's super interesting yeah this has been a lot of fun like this dish it out with all these mm-hmm. you know, different hawaiian foods damn i gotta I'm gonna travel now but we can't but also yeah. gotta travel responsibly as you know mm-hmm. in our interview with uh, dr kajahiro but yes guys thank you for tuning in for this dish it out uh we want to see, you know, what kind of dishes you have to bring to the Dish It Out table. So if you go to our website, if you send us messages on Instagram, Facebook, um, you can submit your own dishes and let us know what what Asian Pacific Islander foods you want us to talk about next on Dish It Out. Yes, and that about wraps it up for this Dish It Out. Don't forget to check out our segment online. Uh, we have a lot of recipes. And, yes. Uh, yeah, in our website. <laughs> so that wraps it up. Thank you again to Dr. Kyle Kachihiro for coming to the Situation Room and for an incredible interview. And thank you all for tuning into this episode. The Situation Room, as always, is produced by Crimson Planet Media. Make sure to check out our website, situationroom.com. Follow us on Instagram and like us on Facebook at The Situation Room for more content. Yes, guys, we mentioned this a couple weeks back, but don't forget to sign up for the Situation Room newsletter. Get all the updates on our show, as well as access to exclusive content by signing up on our website or through the link in our show notes. Also, don't forget to show some love by liking, subscribing to us on YouTube or whatever platform you're using to tune into our show. And we want to hear from you guys. So send us messages and recipes for Dish It Out through our website, slide into our DMs on Instagram, message us on Facebook, let us know what you guys want us to talk about next in the Situation Room. But for now, thank you for joining us on this step of our journey through Asian America. Once again, my name is Emily Villaverde. And I'm Zach King. That, that wraps it up. Yeah. So next season? Yeah. <laughs> Finale time? Yeah, let's do it. <laughs> All right, let's do it. Bye, guys. Bye. All right, we're done. There we go.